Uh, as almost all of you know, Fareed Zakaria is the host of Fareed Zakaria GPS Global Public Square on CNN. Uh, he is a columnist for the Washington Post. He's a contributing editor for the Atlantic. Uh, he's the best-selling author of multiple books. Uh, one of the many awards that he recently has received is uh, being named one of the top 10 global thinkers of the past 10 years uh, by foreign policy in 2019. Uh, when it comes to Fareed Zakaria, I am with Mr. Hillman. Uh, I consider him to be a very smart guy uh, and a person who also makes distinctive contributions to our understandings of our country and our world uh, through his writings and his television program. Uh, so I'm pleased to be able to present him to you today. I want to thank the organizers of the Eradicating Hate uh, Conference uh, for bringing together a remarkable group of people for a very important conversation. Um, I don't know how much I can add to this, uh, this topic, but I can tell you just a few of my own thoughts about this uh, complicated but very, very crucial subject. I tend to think that we have this image that the world was going on along fine and then all of a sudden we've gotten this spew of hatred uh, and violence emanating from that hatred. That's not exactly the case. As uh, Steven Pinker sometimes says, the, uh, the best explanation for a belief in the good old days is a bad memory. Um, there's been a lot of hate for a lot of, of human history. But it's fair to say that at the end of the Cold War and the early 1990s, I think most, most of us, many of us, thought the world was, in a sense, moving to a, a better place, to a more open, more democratic, um, and more tolerant, more liberal world. Um, but if we had looked more carefully and followed more closely what was going on, we would see that while there were these forces, the forces of integration, if you will, that were bringing people together, bringing countries together, uh, opening up the world to trade, seeing the adoption of democracy in more and more countries around the world uh, as the Soviet empire and communist countries collapsed. There was something else going on at the same time. If you look at what was happening in the former Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, you were beginning to see the rise of a kind of ethnic, sectarian hatred that was powerful, potent, dangerous, and very bloody. The degree of ferocity with which uh, the Serbs slaughtered Muslims uh, and the mayhem caused by the collapse of, uh, of Yugoslavia and the demagogic way in which leaders took advantage of those sectarian differences has turned out sadly to be a kind of precursor to many forces we've seen in many countries around the world. Um, if you look at 9-11, in a sense, as the big wake-up call, where we came face to face with a certain kind of hatred uh, and recognized how powerful it was and how many people seemed motivated by it, that was another uh, indication that we, were, uh, that we were witnessing some very strong strains uh, in human society that, uh, that hadn't gone away. Um, you know, there's always been this fear, this, this hope uh, that rationalism will prevail, that uh, comedy will prevail, that um, the more people are guided by their rational uh, uh, self, the, the we will see less of this kind of irrational hatred. But it turns out that that other part in the human character is very strong. And so what you saw uh, come out of the war on terror after 9-11 was not just the clashes between militant Islamists and jihadists and terrorists and uh, the West and Western soldiers in various parts of the world, 
But you also then began to see what was really going on, which was a war within the world of Islam, uh, which itself was sectarian and ferocious. The civil war in Iraq, in which people, Sunnis, Shia, slaughtered each other with a kind of brutal ferocity, uh, is something that I think few of us would have imagined. I remember going to Iraq in the middle of some of the, one of the worst periods of that, of that civil war, of that, those militia on militia fightings. And the things that we were seeing reported, uh, we're, we're, we're hearing about, even seeing in some cases, were just blood curdling. People using power drills um, to drill holes in each other's heads uh, as, a way of, uh, as a way of exacting punishment, revenge, murder, uh, execution. And so you ask yourself, where did it go from there? Um, and I have to say the most distressing part about all, all of this, this, this wave of irrationality, of hatred, of sectarianism, is that far from, you know, from, from quietening down, uh, it actually ended up spreading in a very strange way. Um, instead of exporting democracy to the Middle East, we seem to have imported sectarianism from the Middle East. Um, I look at America today and it feels as though we are all Sunnis and Shias. There is so much anger, so much animosity, so much hatred, so many loose uh, calls for violence, so much talk about things like secession. Um, and all of a sudden it feels as though we have become Sunnis and Shias. Uh, and that polarization feeds into the actual problem of hatred because uh, not all the people who disagree politically uh, in any sense uh, are militant and not even the militant ones are, are all violent. But it, it is a chain, it is a continuum which we have allowed to develop and we have created a, a more and more permissive atmosphere in which it's possible to paint the other as an enemy uh, an enemy of the republic, to imagine any compromise with the other as evil. Uh, and that, of course, then fuels the small number of people who believe in using violence. And, and I do believe that that culture of intolerance is much broader now than it was before. And as a result, the culture of violence, which is obviously a much narrower thing, becomes easier. It, 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 it's something that can exist within this environment. Um, we're seeing the rise of various kinds of, uh, of, of right-wing violence. We are also seeing the persistent rise of the oldest prejudice in the world, anti-Semitism, which is now uh, becoming more and more widespread because it has fueled by two forces, um, a kind of right-wing traditional uh, anti-Semitism and let us be frank, uh, uh, a militant Islam uh, or mil militant Islamist uh, anti-Semitism, uh, which is causing an extraordinary degree of uh, insecurity for Jews living everywhere uh, and is one of the great tragedies of the time we live in. So we have to find a way to stop as much of this as we can. We have to try to find a way to reverse the political culture that has allowed these trends to, to grow. Uh, I strongly believe that the, these, that the violence is not simply uh, you know, a kind of aberrational act, a series of aberrational acts that are completely divorced from this highly partisan, highly polarized uh, political culture we've created. Look at the root of it has been a rise in people's sense of their identity uh, as being defined not by, as it was for much of the 20th century, economics, but by culture. Um, my old professor Sam Huntington was right when he said that in the post-Cold uh, War world, the divisions among people were going to be based more on culture and religion than, than on politics and economics. You know, if you think about the 20th century, the big debate was, the big political divide was, um, do you believe in more government, less government. Higher taxes, lower taxes. Uh, those are fundamentally intellectual issues, rational issues, and most importantly, the issues on which you can split the difference. Um, what we have seen over the last 30 or 40 years is the rise of not economics, 
uh, as a defining uh, 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 factor for your political identity, but culture, religion, issues like abortion, gay rights, uh, immigration, uh, women's rights. And the problem is that when your political identity becomes defined entirely by these cultural factors, by these ethnic factors, by gender uh, relations, the game becomes all or nothing. The stakes become very high. Compromise becomes very, very difficult. Now, this is where we are. I do not pretend that we can somehow unwind the reality that our divisions have become much more cultural. Um, they have also, by the way, become more class-oriented. So when you look at elections in America, the single strongest predictor of whether somebody, of why somebody votes uh, the way they do is party loyalty. Republicans vote Republican, Democrats vote Democrat. The second strongest predictor, however, is your level of education. So we are dividing into um, two, two camps, one more educated than the other. The third strongest predictor is do you live in an urban area or a less urban area? So you're seeing we're dividing into these two camps that are uh, culturally distinct, distinct in certain kinds of class ways, uh, and in a, in a way becoming two societies. And what I worry about most is that that kind of polarization, that kind of separation, will not only not allow for compromise, but it will encourage each side to believe the worst of the other, each side to believe that the other uh, is worth defeating at all costs, and fundamentally to lose faith in the sense of democracy, which requires that you believe that the other side can legitimately win and govern an election. One of the scariest things going on in the United States right now is that there are people um, right now dominantly within the Republican Party who believe that they can't, they can't really lose an election. As Donald Trump keeps saying, if we lose, it means that they have cheated. Uh, by definition, therefore, their job is to overturn elections in which Democrats win, because as he says, by definition, they must have cheated. If we get into that world, we are getting into a world of political violence that is going to be much more dramatic than even these terrible, tragic, too many acts of sporadic violence and hatred we're, we're, we're looking at. And for, for us to get out of that, we all have to find a way to dial back this partisanship. I don't have easy or simple solutions, but one thing I will tell you is we're living in an age where all these forces are running wild. They're running wild in the political system. They're running wild in the social media uh, system. They're, they're running wild on the internet. We don't have gatekeepers um, who can effectively police this anymore, and we don't have leaders who seem to want to police this anymore. And so one core element of what we have to start with is by telling the truth, pointing out that we are headed in a very dangerous path, uh, direction. Um, talk about the role that everyone, all of us, have uh, to try and stop it. Uh, in particular, political leaders, but everybody who is involved in some form or the other in, in educating people and trying to get information out, we all have to recognize that we are heading down a path where, far from eradicating hate, we are encouraging it, we are facilitating it, uh, and in a sense, we are almost approving of it if we don't stop right now. So I, I, I don't mean to, uh, I'm generally an optimist by nature. I'm an immigrant. I think America has been one of the great blessings of my life and for millions and millions, tens of millions of people uh, who have come here. Uh, I tend to think that America solves all its problems um, slowly, messily, and with much going back and forth. But this is one I'm genuinely worried about. Um, and I think that it is part of a global phenomenon um, in which it has become far too easy to hate, far too difficult to tolerate, let alone love. Um, and it's important that a conference like this draw attention to it. It's important that we all take it seriously and try to find a way to get out of this mess. Thank you very much.